from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The House of the Bloody Cat I can see Mrs. Hartnell in my mind's eye as distinctly as if I were looking at her now. Hers was a personality that no lapse of time, nothing could efface. A personality that made itself felt on boys of all temperaments. She was classical mistress at the Dame School in Clifton, Bristol, where for three years I was well grounded in all the mysticisms of Kennedy's Latin primer and Smith's first Greek principia. I doubt if Mrs. Hartnell, we never knew her first name, got anything more than a very small salary, for governesses in those days were shockingly remunerated, and the poor soul had to work monstrously hard. Drumming Latin and Greek into heads as thick as ours was no easy task. But there were many times when the excessive tension on the nerves proving too much, Mrs. Hartnell stole a little relaxation when she allowed herself to chat with us and even to smile, heavens, those smiles. And when she spoke about herself, stated she had once been young, a declaration so astounding, so utterly beyond our comprehension that we were rendered quite speechless, and told us anecdotes. Of her many narratives, there is one in particular that remains as fresh in my mind as when she first recounted it. I give it now as far as possible in her own words, as we all heard it then in that hushed classroom. Up to the age of 19, I lived with my parents in the manor house at Oxenby. It was an old building dating back, I believe, to the reign of Edward VI, and had originally served as the residence of noble families, built or rather faced with split flints and edged and buttressed with cut gray stone. It had a majestic though very gloomy appearance, and even from afar resembled nothing so much as a huge and grotesquely decorated sarcophagus. In the center of its frowning and menacing front was the device of a cat, constructed out of black shingles and having white shingles for the eyes. The effect of this was curiously realistic, especially on moonlit nights, when anything more lifelike and sinister could scarcely have been conceived. The artist, whoever he was, had a more than human knowledge of cats. He portrayed not merely their bodies, but their souls. In style, the front of the house was somewhat castellated. Two semicircular bows, or half towers, placed at a suitable distance from each other, rose from the base to the summit of the edifice to the height of four or five stairs, and were pierced at every floor with rows of stone mullioned windows. The flat wall between had larger windows, lighting the great hall, gallery, and upper compartments. These windows were wholly composed of stained glass engraved with every imaginable fantastic design. Imps, satyrs, dragons, witches, queer-shaped trees, hands, eyes, circles, triangles, and cats. The towers half included in the building were completely circular within and contained the winding stairs of the mansion. To ascend the stairs when a storm was raging was to feel that you were being risen by a whirlwind to the clouds. In the upper rooms, even the wildest screams of the storm were drowned in the rattling clamor of the assaulted casements. When a gale of wind took the building in front, it rocked it to the foundations, and at such times threatened its instant demolition. Midway between the towers there stood forth a heavy stone porch with a gothic gateway surmounted by a battlemented parapet made gable fashion the apex of which was garnished by a pair of dolphins rampant and antagonistic whose corkscrew tails seemed contorted especially at night 
by the last agonies of rage convulsed. The porch door stood open except in tremendous weather. The inner ones were regularly shut and barred after all who entered. They led into a wide vaulted and lofty hall. The walls of which were decorated with faded tapestry that rose and fell and rustled in the most mysterious fashion every time there was the suspicion, and often barely the suspicion, of a breeze. Interspersed with the tapestry, and in great contrast to its antiquity, were quite modern and very ordinary portraits of my family. The general fittings and furniture, both of the hall and the house, were somber and handsome. Truss beams, corbels, girdles, and panels were of the blackest oak, and the general effect of all this augmented, if anything, by the windows, which were too high and narrow to admit of much light, was very similar to that produced by the interior of a subterranean chapel. From the hall proceeded doorways and passages, more than my memory can now particularize. Of these portals, one at each end conducted to the tower stairs, others to reception rooms and domestic offices. The whole of the house being too large for us, only one wing, the right and newer of the two was occupied. The other was unfurnished and generally shut up. I say generally because there were times when either my mother or father, the servants never ventured there, forgot to lock the doors and the handles yielding to my daring fingers, I crept in. Everywhere in that unused wing, even in daylight, even on the sunniest of mornings, were dark shadows that hung around the ingles and recesses of the rooms, the deep cupboards, the passages, the silent winding staircases. There was one passage, long, low, and vaulted, where these shadows assembled in particular. I can see them now, as I saw them then as they have come to me many times in my dreams, grouped about the doorways, flitting to and fro on the bare dismal boards, and congregating in menacing clusters at the head of the staircase leading to the cellars. Generally, and excepting when the weather was particularly violent, the silence here was so emphatic that I could never feel it was altogether natural, but rather that it was assumed, especially for my benefit, to intimidate me. If I moved, if I coughed, almost if I breathed, the whole passage was filled with hoarse, reverberating echoes. Once, when fascinated beyond control, I stole on tiptoe along the passage, momentarily expecting a door to fly open and something grim and horrible to pounce out on me. I was brought to a standstill by a loud, clanging noise, as if a pail had been set down very roughly on a stone floor. Then came the sound of rushing footsteps and of someone hastily ascending the cellar staircase. Fearful as to what I should see, I stood in the middle of the passage and stared. Up, up, up they came, until I saw the dark and definite shape of something very horrid. It was accompanied by the clanging of a pail. I tried to scream, but my tongue, cleaving to the roof of my mouth, prevented me, and when I tried to move I found I was temporarily paralyzed. The thing came rushing down on me. I grew icy cold all over, and when it was within a few feet of me, my horror was so great, I fainted. On recovering consciousness, it was some minutes before I summoned up courage to open my eyes. But when I did, so they saw nothing but the empty passage. The thing had disappeared. On another occasion, when I was guiltily playing a visit to the unused wing, it was about to ascend one of the staircases Leading from the same passage to the first floor, there was the sound of a furious scuffle overhead, and something dashed down the stairs past me. I instinctively looked up, and there, glaring down at me from over the balustrade, was a very white face. It was that of a man, but very badly proportioned, the forehead being low and receding, and the rest of the face too long and narrow. The crown rose to a kind of peak, the ears were pointed and set very low down and far back. The mouth was very cruel and thin-lipped, the teeth were yellow and uneven. There was no hair on the face, but that on the head was red and matted. The eyes were obliquely set, pale blue and full of an expression so malignant that every atom of my blood in my veins seemed to congeal as I met their gaze.
I could not clearly see the body of the thing as it was hazy and indistinct, but the impression I got of it was that it was clad in some sort of tight-fitting, fantastic garment. As the landing was in semi-darkness and the face, at all events, was most startlingly visible, I concluded it brought with it a light of its own, though there was none of that lurid glow attached to it, which I subsequently learned is almost inseparable from spirit phenomena seen under similar conditions. For some seconds I was too overcome with terror to move, but my faculties at length reasserting themselves, I turned and flew back to the other wing of the house. One would have thought that after these experiences nothing would have induced me to have run the risk of another such encounter. Yet only a few days after the incident of the head, I was again impelled to visit the same quarters. In sickly anticipation of what my eyes would light upon, I stole to the foot of the staircase and peeped cautiously up. To my great relief, there was nothing there but a bright patch of sunshine, which, in the most unusual fashion, had forced its way through from one of the slits of the windows near at hand. After gazing at it long enough to assure myself it was only sunshine, I continued on my way down the vaulted passage. Just as I was passing one of the doors, it opened. I stopped, terrified. What could it be? Bit by bit, inch by inch, I watched the gap slowly widen. At last, just when I felt I must go, either mad or die, something appeared, and to my utter astonishment, it was a big black cat. Lipping painfully, it came towards me with a curious gliding motion, and I saw with a thrill of horror that it had been very cruelly maltreated. One of its eyes looked as if it had been gouged out, its ears were lacerated, and the paw of one of the hind legs had either been torn or hacked off. As I drew back from it, it made a feeble and pathetic effort to reach me and rub itself against my legs, as is the way with cats, but in so doing it fell down and uttering a half purr, half gurgle vanished, seeming to sink through the hard oak boards. That evening, my youngest brother met with an accident in the barn at the back of the house and died. Though I did not then associate his death with the apparition of the cat, the latter shocked me very much. I was extremely fond of animals. I did not dare venture into the unused wing again for nearly two years. When next I did so, it was early one June morning, between five and six, and none of the family, saving my father who was out in the fields, looking after his men, were as yet up. I explored the dreaded passage and staircase and was crossing the floor of one of the rooms I hitherto regarded as immune from ghostly influences when there was an icy rush of wind. The door behind me slams too violently and a heavy object struck me with great force at the hollow of my back. With a cry of surprise and pain, I turned sharply around and there lying on the floor, stretched out in the last convulsions of death was the big black cat, maimed and bleeding as it had been on the previous occasion. How I got out of the room, I don't recollect. I was too horror-stricken to know exactly what I was doing, but I distinctly remember that as I tugged the door open, there was a low, gleeful chuckle, and something slipped by me and disappeared in the direction of the passage. At noon that day, my mother had a seizure and died at midnight. Again, there was a lapse of years, this time nearly four, when sent on an errand for my father, I turned the key of one of the rooms leading into the empty wing and once again found myself within the haunted precincts. All was just as it had been on the occasion of my last visit. Gloom, stillness, and cobwebs reigned everywhere. While permeating the atmosphere was a feeling of intense sadness and depression. I did what was required of me as quickly as possible and was crossing one of the rooms to make my exit what a dark shadow fell athwart the threshold of the door, and I saw a cat. That evening my father collapsed and died as he was hurrying home through the fields. He had long suffered from heart disease. After his death we, that is to say my brother, sisters, and self, were obliged to leave the house and go out into the world to earn our living. We never went to Oxenby again and never heard 
if any of the subsequent tenants of the house experienced similar manifestations. So ended Mrs. Hartnell's story, but the sequel to it came for me years later when as a young man I stayed for a few weeks near Oxenby and met at a garden party a Mr. and Mrs. Wheeler, the then occupants of the manor house. I asked if they believed in ghosts and told them I had heard their house was haunted. Well, said Mrs. Wheeler, we never believed in ghosts till we came to Oxenby, but we have seen and heard such strange things since we have been in the manor house that we are now prepared to believe anything. They then went on to tell me how they and many of their visitors and servants had seen in one wing of the house the phantasms of a hideous and malignant old man clad in tight-fitting hosiery of medieval days and a maimed and bleeding cat, black cat a big creature that seemed sometimes to drop from the ceiling and sometimes to be thrown at them in one of the passages said the wheelers all sorts of queer sounds such as whinings moanings screeches and the clanging of pails and rattling of chains were heard while something that no one could ever see distinctly but which they all felt to be indescribably obscene rushed up the cellar steps and flew past as if engaged in a desperate chase the disturbances grew to be so frequent and so harrowing that the wing had to be vacated and was eventually locked up but the wheelers being more resolute than earlier tenants did not leave the situation at that they decided to excavate in different parts of the haunted wing with grim results in the cellar at a depth of some eight or nine feet they found the skeletons of three men and two women and in the wainscoting of the passage they discovered the bones of a boy the remains were taken away and given decent burial in the churchyard everything now seemed to bear out local tradition which had been handed down through centuries by word of mouth this was to the effect that the manor house originally belonged to a knight who with his wife was killed while out hunting he had only one child a boy of about ten who became a ward in chancery the man appointed by the crown as guardian to this child proved an inhuman monster and after ill-treating the lad in every conceivable way eventually murdered him and tried to substitute a bastard boy of his own in his place for a time the fraud succeeded but in it eventually being found out the murderer and his offspring were both brought to trial and hanged during the guardian's occupation of the house many people were seen to enter the premises but never leave them and consequently the place got the most sinister reputation among other deeds credited to the murderer and his offspring was a mutilation and boiling of a cat the particular pet of the young heir who was compelled to witness the whole revolting process years later a subsequent owner of the property had a monument erected in the churchyard to the memory of this poor abused child and on the front of the house constructed the device of the cat mr and mrs wheeler invited me to visit the not quite and reopen winged at the manor house and as i paced the old rooms i vividly recalled mrs hartnell's experience there and wondered whether news of the later remarkable events at her former home ever reached her.